Hello and welcome. My name is Chloe Spivey Lowe and I'm Reaper's Public Programs Manager and I'm really happy to be welcoming you all to the fifth event in our talk series, Architecture Anew, which today is all about rewilding. Architecture Anew is in fact Reaper's first public talk series focusing entirely on sustainability. And over the past few months, our events have aimed to expand contemporary debate on the topic to look more holistically at sustainability to embrace social, economic and environmental concerns. Next slide, please. Architecture Anew is part of our ongoing partnership with Vitra Bathrooms, and I would like to thank Vitra Bathrooms for sponsoring this important series. I'm particularly pleased to be welcoming you all to this event tonight, as whilst researching for the series, rewilding was definitely one of the areas that I felt could be brought into architectural conversations more. And that is why we felt it'd be a really important theme to cover in this series. And we brought together a range of architects, designers, and activists to explain to you far better than I could what it's all about and what we can all do to take part. Shortly, I will hand over to our brilliant chair for this evening, Dusty Gedge. But just before that, I wanted to give you a brief housekeeping overview of this talks platform we're using tonight, Hopin, to ensure that everyone joining in gets the most out of it and knows how to contact us if you have any issues. So you should all be able to see a chat and a Q&A box somewhere near this video stream. For those on computers, it will be to the right of your video. Um, but for those joining on other devices like smartphones, it might look slightly different. Um, please do say hello and share your comments or experiences with your own rewilding projects and any thoughts on tonight's presentations in the chat if you'd like to. We know for some chat boxes can be a bit distracting, so if that's you, feel free to maximise this video stream with one of the toggles in the bottom of this video now to avoid seeing any comments. Another setting to mention that can be found in the bottom of the video um, is something to help you adjust the quality of the video. So Hopin automatically streams to its highest setting, which is a HD setting. So if your feed is a bit pixelated, you can try one of the lower resolution settings, which actually will make it better um, quality if your internet connection isn't as strong as required for full HD. If anyone experiences this and isn't quite sure what to do, you can use the chat to let us know and we'll guide you through it. Towards the end, we're going to try a couple of live audience Q&As, and I mean webcams and all. So please submit your questions for the panel tonight uh, via the Q&A box for a chance to do this. Backstage, I will be selecting a number of those submitted and we'll get in touch with you directly um, with a web link that will take you to this backstage area. If you've submitted a question, please try to check your direct messages and hop in to receive my instructions. You will see this as a red notification in the top right, which looks a little bit like Instagram DMs. Please bear with us when we get to the Q&As, but we hope to keep it as smooth as possible. After tonight's talk, you will also be able to use the networking feature, which for those on desktops can be found on the left-hand side. For those joining, it will randomly match you up with another willing audience member for a chat. It's a bit like speed dating. So for three minutes, you can enjoy each other's company, and if you want, you can extend it. This will be open for up to 30 minutes after the talk ends, so do try it out. And the last feature to direct you to is the info zone, also to the left hand side, which can provide some further information on where you can find recordings of the previous events in this talk series and also a chance to chat to our sponsors. That was a lot of information, but hopefully it will now help you navigate this new platform a bit better tonight. Uh, but now I'm pleased to get the event started by handing over to Dusty Gedge, who will take over as chair for the rest of the event. Dusty is an internationally recognised industry leader on green roofs and urban adaptation through green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. In 2008, Dusty helped write the first London Living Roofs policy, which has seen more than a million square metres of green roofs added to the capital over the last decade. Um, so without further ado, Dusty, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, um, and I, I have a, a new role the last uh, six months. I'm an expert in residence at uh, the Bartlett School of architecture at UCL, where I'm um, I'm helping develop and act act um, UCL acts through uh, delivering green infrastructure, and uh, it's actually 2.5 million square meters of green roofs um, that I've helped impose on architecture, especially at roof level in the Greater London area and actually around the world, and it's relevant to tonight's um, uh, discussion uh, and series of talks. Um, there's five short presentations, and then uh, the idea is that we, those presentations and myself, stimulate an interesting and exciting discussion about how architecture rewilding can actually start to make the world a better place. And there was a, a landscape architect years ago who, who wrote, it was about five years ago, on the Nature of Cities uh, website. She wrote an article saying, perhaps if we design cities for nature and the countryside for people, the world would be a better place. 
And so our series of talks start from the small, small pockets of land in cities or towns or villages that can be rewilded up to the building scale, up to the neighborhood scale, and then to the big landscape scale. And so without any further ado, and I've just got to find my notes here, excuse me, is um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is, I've got to find him, yes, uh, somebody I, I know well, and I know his work well, Richard Reynolds, who began urban guerrilla gardening in 2004, cultivating neglected public flower beds and roadside verges in South in his South London neighbourhood without permission. This developed into a campaign for others to do also to enrich public land with uplifting and biodiverse habitats in a way that is environmentally and socially positive. Richard has a gardening qualification from the Royal Horticultural Society and a job free degree from Oxford University. He decamped from London in 2018 and returned to Devon, where he grew up. But he continues to find plenty of public spaces to transform and sometimes even with permission. He has no garden of his own. So, Richard, I'm going to hand over to you to give us your short presentation. OK, hello, everyone. Um, I am a, a, an accidental activist. I'm an enthusiastic amateur. This is my hobby and obsession. And it started when I moved here. Um, the heart of urban South London, it's a very urban environment, as you can see, Elephant and Castle. Um, actually, surprisingly, lots of mature trees in there as well. But at the kind of human scale, um, at the roadside verge flowerbed scale, pretty bleak. And this is our view from a high rise um, flat. And it was the neglected planters that really were a, a, a bait an itch that triggered me to, to transform them. Um, my motivation was beautification. Um, and that is still my primary motivation. But the, the beautiful thing about making uh, landscapes more attractive using flowering plants particularly, um, is that they are attractive for people. Uh, sorry, Richard, uh, sorry to, to stop you. Um, we can't see your slides at the moment. Can you just try sharing them one more time? Thank okay, you. sorry about that. No problem. Um, Okay, we'll just get back to it. Hadn't gone too far into the slideshow, so you've not missed too much. Um, okay, window. Let's try again. Okay, you can now see it, I'm sure. Um, so this is this is what I was looking at. This is the context and. In 2004, um, late at night, I started digging up the planters around the tower block that the local authority, Southwark, had, had not tended to for months, um, and years went by. Uh, they turned a blind eye, eventually got permission, reluctantly given, but by that point, it was hard for them to say no. Um, and so went my guerrilla gardening, um, starting here and then spreading around the neighbourhood. Um, as enthusiastic gardeners tend to find, um, you see a great plant or you see potential in a corner of your garden or beyond, in my case, and you want to do something about it. And much of London uh, and our towns and cities and, and, and even countryside roads remain just um, regularly or periodically strimmed grassy wastelands, which could be more beneficial for us um, directly. Um, and through the nature that benefits them. So this patch near Lambeth North, uh, borderland between two local authorities, was transformed into what we call the London Lambeth North Lavender Field, which um, thrived for many years. Um, it is still there. Um, it's a great social space as well. Um, a huge part of the motivation now for me um, is also the interaction of gathering people um, at places both to tend, but also just to chat. Um, it's a great conversation starter to be to be gardening in, in a public space like this. And so we would harvest that lavender um, every year, which was also a helpful fundraiser. Unfortunately, and this is a pattern that I began to experience um, in the latter part of the last decade, um, the landowners, having turned a blind eye for years, eventually began to see their landscape differently. And this is the lavender field after an unprovoked random attack by Transport for London. Um, there is a cultural inclination in many organisations who own public land to 
keep things simple. The simplest would be to leave them to the nature of local residents or local nature with pretty minimal um, tending just to ensure that they don't look neglected. But that instinct um, or that logic uh, isn't there yet and it tends to be um, bare earth, cubing a shrub, um, unseasonal hacking uh, because somebody somewhere has a sense that it needs to be done. Um, so it was never explained to me and I, I backed off um, after this, although the, the patch has to some extent recovered and others have of course stepped in, other local residents to to see the opportunity. Um, another one at St George's Circus, again, same context, bare patch of land, um, transformed by guerrilla gardening over many years, flourishing. We're here with verbena and hollyhocks, but um, the, the TFL diggers eventually moved in to create what they call um, a piazza. Um, their designer justified to me the appeal of vistas of stone. Um, so a complete removal of, of the garden and no new green at all, despite the fact that it's not a gathering area. Um, it's not a, not a piazza in the continental sense of the word, but this, this has been the mindset. Um, so we return back to my original home uh, in London, that is at the Elephant and Castle Roundabout in its leafy glory um, in 2014, but again, that instinct to, to piazzify unfortunately prevailed. Um, we, we brought to, to life the potential in the place with a, a piece of choreography working with the Siobhan Davis Dance Studio. Um, we created a mobile meadow, um, both sowing a more permanent seasonal meadow, as well as these um, engaging conversation starting uh, contraptions that we processed around Elephant to try and um, inspire a different direction, uh, which to some extent we can see the legacy of in the um, hundreds of thousands of pound projects that um, some of the developers like to, to show off. Quite an unnecessary expense uh, in my view. So this is what happened to the roundabout, um, great deforestation and destruction, but uh, it didn't stop us. Even during construction, we um, sowed seeds in, in, in the temporary pathways here we've got some sweet alisum and california poppies and um, fragrantly enhancing the the building site um, for one season and these little interventions you know a packet of seeds on some disturbed land um, are so simple but so full of uh, benefit um, here i am <laughs> making the case to a large crowd on a guided walk of a pavement gorilla garden um, a bit up the road which at the time i was trying to present to TfL, I got a meeting with them, but sadly no result, to, to turn the super highways that they were building for cyclists into nature super highways. Um, I, I offered to um, be custodian uh, of some lavender down the centre of this prior to its construction, but um, once again, the mantra vistas of stone was presented to me as the only option, which of course is ridiculous because plenty of cities um, particularly elsewhere in the world, I've seen uh, in Tokyo and in many parts of Germany, um, would instinctively green these concrete ribbons. They'd be safer for that too. So I abandoned London uh, in the end. The battle with Boris as mayor and Southwark Council became too disheartening. Um, so I thought I'd give, uh, give it another go. So moved to a home with no garden, albeit um, in a more rural location in Totnes. Castle Street instead of Elephant and Castle. Um, and news reached Totnes as I was there and I was quickly directed towards places that residents wanted improving, which has worked out pretty well. Um, this scrappy patch of land left over from a development um, which had great ambitions as being a place for children to play, and pond dipping, benches and all sorts. We, we dug over, just a few laminate notices by the fence entrance inviting people to join us for the morning. Um, had helped rotivating the land from a contractor who normally works elsewhere in, in the district. And we sowed it. And here it is later that summer. This has thrived for a couple of years. A uh, bit more complicated since, but that's another story. Um, another area to revive, this plaque commemorates a garden laid out for the um, Queen's coronation. But the garden had seen better days. Um, so... 
uh, a very satisfying little restoration, re-established the semicircular bed, retained the, the rather unhappy agapanthus, have thinned them out a bit since then. Um, and you can see here thriving uh, garden, albeit presenting the new challenge now that you know the world has moved on and South Ham's district council are enlightenedly considering the benefits of uh, less mowing on these verges. Um, the side effect for the gorilla gardener is that one's more formal displays can get a bit lost. So um, I wanted to readdress that balance slightly. Um, so I have reduced the uh, grass there. Pedestrians can at least now see it. Now, from my point of view, it's not just the extrovert enthusiasm to, to show the garden, but it's also a form of preservation because were the strimmers of South Ham's District Council to come along later in the season when those alliums are looking a little bit less beautiful, um, the whole thing risks being cut down. So a degree of interaction uh, and human touch needs to be maintained. I even extended the vista to the um, large roundabouts that um, passes by. So I've replaced the elephant roundabout for, for this one which so far is safe from Boris Johnson's piazzification. Um, at the gateway to the town, the gateway of Castle Street, where pedestrians walk away from Totnes Railway Station, was an old bed that, again, had seen better days. Cordeline looking a mess. Um, sorry, New Zealand flax. Um, and we cleared that out and added soil. And it is now thriving. And at the top of the road, we have transformed this rather sad-looking park again with modest interactions plants donated from residents nearby um, a bit of help from uh, the topless gardens fund which the council put a bit of money into probably total budget about a thousand pounds and these things can be done so simply um, it's encouraged other residents to to plant bits and pieces up the street um, as well um, it's my last slide I'm sorry i'm a little bit over time um, Ultimately, this is about encouraging people to just get out there and do it and the authorities to have the confidence to allow that to happen and for the perception that vast budgets um, and vast levels of professionalism are needed to be, to be questioned um, so that it is facilitated far more frequently. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Shock, shock, shock. Gorilla Garden you know, goes to Gorilla Mower. No, but makes a very interesting, important, um, um, important note about maintenance where it's needed, but not maintenance all the time. So we're now going to move up to the building scale, scale, and we're going to talk to Maria. Uh, Maria Chiara Piccinelli is going to do a presentation. She is an architect and a director of PIM Studio Architects in London. Maria is particularly interested in the technical aspects of architecture the finer details, the way things fit together, the materials. As she is in the way, sorry, as she is in the way we use the spaces in which we live and work. She is a strong believer in the importance of public spaces for a city to thrive in the and in the crucial role nature plays within architecture. Maria. Hello, everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, being here today, and I want to thank the RIBA uh, for inviting me. I'm here to talk about uh, rewilding architecture, and rewilding for me, in my opinion, is about reintegrating wildlife and wild lands where species have disappeared, while restoring natural ecosystem with a less human-centric approach. We know that since men start building um, habitat, habitable structure, architecture has been intended to protect human beings from the elements and honestly, in my opinion, to separate us from the natural environment. This is a very anthropocentric view that has driven human for centuries, trying to build and control their own environment and everything else. And we try so very hard to control the environment that in some very interesting cases, uh, where human leave, then nature takes back control in a very powerful and fascinating way. Nature is able to adapt and reuse what is there and make amazing spaces out of it. Our cities, of course, are man-made, but a lot of our natural environment is fundamentally man-made. This is the case in dense uh, urban setting as well in lower density urban setting. 
uh, but most rural areas in the so-called developed countries are equally man-made in research of full control. Even when they produce amazing wine, they are still very much man-made. And there's so much that when we see a bit of a plant wilderness, then it looks completely surreal to us. But it wouldn't be nice if we could design our cities and buildings to accept and encourage wildness. We should, in my opinion, stop considering man-made civilization and natural world in opposition, actually the way we work at Pink Studio Architects. We are trying to move away from this anthropocentric vision of the built and non-built environment in favor for a deep and more meaningful integration between cities and nature and all living beings. I, I really liked what Dusty was mentioning earlier about we should design cities, start designing cities for nature and actually for this integration. The nature already is adapting to us, even in very unfortunate circumstances, are able to adapt, we are, are we actually able to adapt to nature? If we start again looking at architecture and uh, looking at how in the past architecture forms were very intuitive and how they were the direct translation of the needs of the community. So for example, this is a monastery in Arcobasa built in the mid 12th century. There were more over uh, 19 monks housed in the monastery. And uh, this is an example of a colossal chimney that was in the kitchen that was designed to accommodate an entire ox over the fire pit. And in the kitchen, there were basins where the river water were running through and cooks could catch fish, fresh fish for dinner directly. So you can start see how architecture is designed to include also other beings, other animals in addition to humans. So starting from this idea of how can we reintegrate and, uh, or kind of learn from uh, those examples in how we can reintegrate wildlife within architecture. We uh, study a proposal for the Seven Oaks Visitor Center for a competition. The proposal um, was to really fit the building in harmony with the surrounding nature in two ways of integration. One, the building was engaging the surrounding landscape by opening itself towards the outside, the lake and the nature, and towards the uh, large terrace and outdoor studio. On the other, we were seeking to integrate nature within the building itself by maximizing opportunities for the re reserve flora and fauna to use and occupy the building as part of the natural environment. A simple triangular timber structure and the roof with different pitches creates a shelter for the different function of the visitor center, but also the roof itself is designed to naturally encourage the growth of moss and really creating this idea of an architecture that is welcoming, soft, and porous. So how these gaps, uh, we imagine those gaps felt like filled with uh, life and kind of creating a new biodiverse uh, building. The whole architecture, it becomes an ecosystem itself with multiple niches, spaces of every type. We bring wildlife at the design table as part of our client body. So we thought to include other species into the design and we try again to study a prototype for cohabitation be between nature and man. Expanding the subject of architecture to other forms. So it's a really a radical re-articulation of the relationship between humans, uh, technology and other species. We believe that interstitial spaces and in-between spaces are where encounter can happen. So architecture should create the opportunity through integration. We are working as well on a private house in Geneva that is actually now under construction. We have been finding ways to incorporate into the design, some of the principles we have learned into our research. The house is all um, sitting around a patio uh, that is, uh, let's say, inspired by the Japanese 
uh, houses where you have this like tiny small touch of nature that reconnects the outdoor with the indoor, creating always a space that is seems large and seems like really in between inside and outside. So finally, it's the house that is in between the garden and uh, the patio. So we wanted to connect with nature, not just the morphology of the architecture, but also using local natural material. We are using uh, bricks that are made from the soil of the site. We will paint the walls with a clay um, that will naturally control the humidity inside the house. And we use the green roof, of course, to increase uh, the architectural biodiversity. We have even lift the house uh, a bit from the ground in order to really create a kind of natural uh, passage uh, to uh, the um, for the uh, small species, like exactly as it happens in Japanese architecture. So this is like a small section of the house. And, and finally, I think that personally, we really need to focus on creating these in-between spaces that can expand inside and outside uh, concept so we, we can meet the needs of the family as well as the needs of other species. I personally think that the issue of control is the key element of the relationship between humans and nature. We often want to really hold tight to the control, uh, but I think it's a bit foolish to think we can fully control the natural world. As the biologist Dan, uh, Rob Dunn in Never Home Alone show us that if we are truly thriving our homes, we must learn how to welcome unknown guests that have been there the whole time. So we believe the architecture should be an ecosystem on its own and we should be able to live and breathe within it. Just some pictures of the house, like how it's evolving, how is like all the natural materials are coming together. And then finally, just looking at the, how, again, in the history, even at a smaller scale, uh, we can see, uh, for example, the brands in his collection uh, of domestic animals, how we can see the joining man-made and natural material, exposing the link between the seemingly opposing concept, nature and technology, landscape and architecture, wildness, and civilization actually just going beyond this uh, idea of opposition, we could actually make the design possible. We can actually lift the teapot, actually drink the tea because of this opportunity and this integration between natural and technology and technological. Very, uh, like, very quickly, like uh, this is a music room uh, proposal for, um, uh, for this small building that really integrates uh, within uh, the landscape is kind of fitting in the mountain in the north of Italy and the architecture is designed as a continuity with the landscape. The green roof integrates the volume uh, within the section of the earth. So we can see how the green roof becomes an opportunity for everyone, for all the species. It's something that happened in vernacular architecture very, very often, but then we have lost it uh, a little bit. But again, the whole itself is really thought to be a connection between inside and outside is looking at the archetype of the Hellenic theater and where like Greek architects linked the theater in such a place that give the ocean the spectacular view, not just of the actor and the stage, but also the landscape. Yeah, the, the landscape was as important, so sorry, as important as uh, the play. So we actually are uh, thinking of how uh, the community and the community that lives and use the spaces is as important as, uh, let's say, our work as a designer, as, as an architect. So at PIM Studio, we really believe that this work within our local community is essential, working with uh, uh, people living close to us uh, is, as I say, like collaboration is not just between architecture and nature, but also between the architect and the local community and the community that we are part of. So we uh, are part of this uh, Garden of Earth the Light in Hackney. We just help negotiating with the council a new space and we worked on a garden assembly to uh, uh, design the garden together with uh, the local community. And again, like going back or the relationship between the landowners 
it, I really trust that it's our responsibility as a designer to be guarantor, let's say, uh, for the local community, to be in between the local community and, um, uh, let's say, the different uh, uh, landowners, it can be a council, it can be TFL, but really trying to push the vision of the local community in, working with the people and empowering, especially women working and, and in this strong relationship, starting from the strong relationship that naturally women have with nature and earth. Yes, I want to thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Maria. Let's make buildings ecosystems for both people and nature. So now I'm going to hand over to, to Gwen Stacy, who is a senior lecturer, lecturer on CATS uh, Masters of Architecture Sustainable Architecture course. He's a multidisciplinary designer and architect. Around his teaching commitments, he collaborates on community and domestic projects across Wales. He also volunteers for conservation organisations in support of their joint aims of protecting historical heritage and the environment. Over to you, Gwyn. Great. Thank you, Justine. And uh, thank you to the RIBA for inviting me to speak today. Um, so as Dusty said, I'm one of the academic team uh, here at CAT, um, and we define sustainable architecture as fully acknowledging the impact of humanity on our planet uh, and the need to restore it to balance. Uh, and we aim to provide the tools for our students um, to act um, by holding ecocentric values as equal to anthropocentric ones. Um, and I suppose that's why I'm here today to talk to you about rewilding, but more broadly, um, architecture and the biosphere within which uh, we operate and live. So I'm gonna talk through uh, five points uh, relatively quickly. Um, so firstly about the R word, rewilding itself, um, architecture's wider impact um, on ecology and um, our biosphere, um, the need to think landscape scale, uh, the need to continuously think about the materials we're using, and then just some pointers on how I think we can uh, practice for nature. Um, so before we talk about um, nature or wildlife, uh, we first need to talk about rewilding and the R word itself. Um, so Rewilding Britain, uh, an organisation, they describe rewilding as uh, the large-scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. Uh, rewilding seeks to reinstate natural processes and where appropriate missing species and allow them to shape the landscape and habitat within. So when you take that definition, uh, you have to ask yourself how much does rewilding in the true sense have to uh, play with regards to architecture? Um, so, but there, there is still plenty of opportunity to talk about uh, ecology, wildlife, habitat uh, within architecture um, and rewilding as well. Um, but within this, we also have to acknowledge that rewilding as a term continues to be divisive and toxic. Um, and that's largely due to the lack of nuanced conversation um, with people that might find it uh, divisive and toxic. Um, it can also be perceived to be a colonial pursuit, um, a colonial activity um, where people with power, authority or money distant from rurality um, or landscapes are able to dictate and manage um, or perceived to be able to dictate and manage uh, the livelihoods and land of indigenous communities. And when I say indigenous communities, I do mean here in the UK as well, certainly here in Wales. Um, as uh, those photos allude to, we've had projects um, that have fallen foul to this and their messaging has changed um, for the better because of it. Um, so how we use language and how we communicate is really key when we're talking about um, people's livelihoods, people's homes, people's land. Um, and we need to really navigate with care, especially if as architects we're potentially engaging as facilitators in discussions around uh, rewilding and land use. Um, and they're really not simple arguments. There are fair, reasonable, 
uh, viewpoints on all sides that all need to be listened to. We need to do that with care, but we need to do that at a pace that's appropriate for the emergencies that we face. So as well as rewilding, um, we also have to still acknowledge and remember architecture's broader impact um, on the environment and on ecology. So you can split that into two ways. So architecture has a direct ecological impact, but also indirect ecological impact. So directly, it can be the loss of habitat, um, or it can be habitat and ecosystem degradation or fragmentation. So losing habitat, that might be the footprint of a site, or it might be the features on the site already, or any um, buildings as well that are currently being used as habitat. Um, degradation and fragmentation, there are so many ways um, that architecture impacts uh, these things and causes this. Uh, it could be from light pollution, it could be from physical barriers that we put up. Um, simply by us humans being present changes the behavior of animals. That's habitat degradation. Um, but broader than this, there's also indirect ecological impacts um, through the consumables that we use within buildings. So materials, energy, water, waste. Um, each of those, not every individual building, but when we look at the industry as a whole, they can cause loss, degradation and fragmentation to habitats, ecosystems, but also whole bioregions as well. Um, so we really have to be careful about what those consumables are that we use. Um, and those compound the other pressures that we have um, on the biosphere um, and act to enhance biosphere breakdown. Um, so we really do have to try and mitigate it. Coupled with this, obviously, the fossil fuels that we use to power, heat, cool our buildings um, also contribute to climate breakdown, which is also a huge factor in the breakdown of um, our ecosystems and our environment. And at the moment, these are hardly regulated. Um, maybe loss of habitat in the UK is fairly well regulated, um, but we need to be doing far more um, to regulate against these things to protect wildlife and species. So we need to think about the landscape scale of things. Um, we can't just think about our site um, in isolation. Um, so urban areas in the UK account for about 6% of the land mass. Globally, that's much less. Um, and we have to acknowledge um, our wider impact in these areas. Um, so how we manage land is really key. So these are some graphics from uh, CATS Zero Carbon Britain research that we continue, um, that is a continuing piece of research and is ongoing. And we set out a technically feasible scenario for reaching zero carbon Britain by 2030. And in that we look at land use. Now in this, we set out that in 2030, we would aim to have approximately another mega hectare of land given over to unmanaged spaces or rewilded spaces, if you like. Um, but if you look in at this chart on the pink, orange and yellow spaces, this is the land that we use to feed ourselves. And by changing the way that we, the diets that we eat, um, we can have a hugely positive impact um, on our environment and our landscape. So maybe we should be using our positions as designers um, in discussions with our clients to discuss maybe what the food is that's going to be uh, consumed within that building. So can we support our clients to think about those things as well as the materials that they might specify the building with or how they might implement wild gardens and other parts. So we have to um, improve landscape biodiversity in all areas um, and acknowledge that at the landscape scale is where the real answers are and also be aware that at, a, at an urban scale um, by introducing wild spaces we're, we're not creating truly wild spaces. We're always creating an imbalanced um, wild space, I suppose, that may require a bit more management um, or may require a bit more inputs. Um, so there's limits to urban biodiversity. That's 
absolutely not a reason to do it, and I'm not here to say that at all. Uh, we certainly should be doing far more. Um, but it's just something that we have to keep in the back of our mind that there is a bigger scale out there. Now, one of the ways that we can influence the landscape scale is through the materials that we specify. So material specification affects both managed and unmanaged landscape. Um, there's a great move and a shift towards low carbon materials, which is uh, long overdue and very much welcome. Um, but low carbon doesn't always mean ecologically friendly. Um, it certainly helps, but we just have to really tread carefully. Um, and planting more trees, as is often said, alone won't help us. We need to be thinking in complex ways, and there are complex solutions. Um, so we can't oversimplify these things. In our buildings, then, if we pursue a local and natural hierarchy, um, we're going to understand the impacts of the materials, and they're going to have, hopefully, a reduced impact. But as I said, natural materials and uh, natural resources have their own problems around in, surrounding monocultures um, and also the uh, supplements that we give to natural resources to make them grow quicker or kill pests or whatever it may be. So we have to know what we're specifying and understand a bit about the management of them as well. Um, and they also need to be pro appropriate for the climate that within which we're designing. Then once we've specified materials, the finishes and preservatives on them can also have a damaging impact ecologically. So quite often facade materials are coated in fungicides and biocides um, to kill um, and prevent maybe algae growth or moss growth or those sorts of things. The paints and glues can also damage um, the environment through manufacture, but also in their life. Uh, and at the end of life as well. Um, so we need to be really careful and understand what we are detailing. Also make sure there's rigorous maintenance protocols in place um, so that we're trying to mitigate any use of any of those nasty finishes and preservatives. So finally then, I'm just gonna touch on um, how I think we should be practicing for nature now, the points I've raised before are really not about trying to um, do less because we're aware of the larger scale and only at the larger scale can things change. Um, it's absolutely not that. It's just to seek to have a holistic understanding um, of the issues, but then also of the opportunities. So the first point uh, that I have is take advice. Um, we absolutely need to have ecologists on board on our projects much more than we currently do. Um, we are not ecologists and ecologists will always know more um, than we do and may be able to mitigate those uh, site direct impacts on the environment and on the local habitats and wildlife to our sites. We need to aim to understand our bioregion just as much as we aim to understand climate and microclimate so that we're designing bioregional and climate appropriate uh, architecture. Then, as I said before, we always need to work to mitigate impacts at a larger scale and promote and enhance biodiversity at every given opportunity. Um, we need to get educated. It's really problematic that uh, we don't spend an, any time really with ecologists during our training. Um, so get out there and learn um, and then become the educators to our clients, to our communities, um, pass that knowledge on. Um, just as Maria and Richard have talked about, listening, collaborating and co-designing is a really important factor of practicing for nature. Um, so it's taking the ego out of architecture. Um, I think rejecting the anesthetic nature of practice uh, spending time outside in our environments, uh, getting hands on with materials, natural resources. Um, the fact that we don't do those things creates an anesthetic nature in architectural practice, and we have to try and move away from that. And then finally, the final point is just to be conscientious um, and embrace the complexity uh, that surrounds this topic and that also surrounds the environment 
ecosystems are highly complex um, structures and have multi uh, facets and relationships uh, between different species. Um, so it is a really complex thing to work around, uh, but we also we just have to embrace that and also embrace um, the complexity of aiming to work um, and practice for nature. Uh, thank you very much. Gwyn, I think uh, we need to blur the boundaries between the rural and the urban, but we also need to take into account the specifics of both areas, particularly in terms of people who actually live in rural areas who are indigenous. So I'm now going to, oh dear, I've got my notes out of all that. I'm now going to hand over to, to Jess. I've just got to find Jess's introduction. Sorry, Jess. Oh dear, there's Gwen. Yeah. So Jess Kennedy is a childhood environmentalist and associate director at Arab, specialising in ESG advisory with over 18 years experience in both consulting and industry in the UK and Australia. Jess helps to deliver social environmental benefits within the built environment by partnering with her clients at a corporate or organisational level over the long term. Over to you, Jess. Thanks, Dusty. Um, hi, everyone. So in preparing for today, I was thinking about the, the principles of rewilding and how that applies to Wild West End, given we have wild in our title, but we're also in a very urban context. And I think the key rewilding concept that applies in this context is is creating connections and that's both creating connections between people and nature by introducing more green space into the urban environment but also connecting habitats for wildlife through the creation of green corridors um, and then also there's an element of this of, of letting nature take its course um, where that's possible in this environment so that might be seeing what takes on a biodiverse roof for example or providing a range of habitat features with the understanding that if we provide the habitat, um, nature will come. So I'm just going to take you through um, some slides explaining um, Wild West End and, and how, how it works. So um, going back in, in, in time a little bit, so um, I'm a sustainability consultant. So I um, I began working with the Crown Estate back in 2012, I think, on their um, um, as a sustainability advisor and as part of this um, I was helping them um, look at uh, ecology across their estate um, and this is their London portfolio you've got Regent Street and St James you've got uh, Regent's Park um, to the north and you've got um, Green Park and St James to the south and so quite quickly the 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 opportunity to to think about this as a as, as a sort of corridor connecting these two areas of parkland came about, and so we developed a, a, an urban greening strategy which helped to um, bring this uh, concept to to life. We had a vision. We set we set targets, including a target for uh, for a green corridor, so that we could measure success. So we defined that as 100 square meters um, of green space every 100 meters. And we had guidance and, and and processes for implementation, and it was it was um, uh, it, it got some traction. It was, it was quite su successful within Crown Estate, and so then the question became: Well, if we could um, get others to adopt this approach, we could create even greater benefit in this area, and think about not just a corridor but a network of green spaces, and that's where the idea of Wild West End um, came about. Uh, so what is Wild West End? Wild West End is a partnership um, between um, major landholders in the area. Uh, so that is the Crown Estate, Grosvenor, Shaftesbury, Great Portland Estate, the Portman Estate, Howard de Walden and Church Commissioners, and most recently uh, Capco. There is also an overlay of business improvement districts um, in this area. And so last year, uh, we formed the Wild West End Bid Network to help support the landholders in, in, in the objectives of Wild West End. And we also have uh, strategic partners, the uh, London Wildlife Trust and the, the Greater London Authority. Um, and Arup is um, a technical partner to Wild West End. So Wild West End has three main objectives. Um, 
the first being to improve the well-being of residents, workers and visitors by increasing connections to green space and improving um, the local environment. Um, and secondly, to enhance biodiversity and ecological connectivity. And then thirdly, to raise awareness and promote uh, the benefits of green infrastructure. So uh, in working in partnership, um, partners agree to um, some of the following. So fundamentally, it's trying to increase the value of existing green space and create new areas of green space in the area. Um, work together, contribute funding uh, to joint initiatives, um, uh, fund mo monitoring every two years of the green spaces and wildlife. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Uh, they share information and data on green space, installations, information and lessons learned, and promote and share publicly the work of World West End. We also provide access to green spaces for research um, where opportunities come up and um, support preparation of guidance for, for the industry and, and meet regularly to, to share ideas and drive the partnership forward. Um, Broadly, the benefits of partnership in this context, um, there's greater environmental benefit from um, um, working together and thinking about the, the area as a whole and not just individual developments. There's efficiency of effort um, and resources that goes into working together. There's um, greater profile and awareness of the work that the partners are doing individually through the Wild West End platform. It supports the long-term stewardship um, goals that the landowners have. Um, and it facilitates collaboration and, and engagement opportunities more easily. Uh, so in terms of the types of spaces we're talking about, I mean, it, it's central London, it's a very, very urban environment. So we're talking about um, small, lots and lots of small spaces and some slightly more significant spaces where, where there's the space on the roof, for example. So we're thinking about um, biodiverse roofs, window boxes, um, uh, food growing allotments when we where we can, um, planters, trees, um, garden squares, green walls, um, roof terraces, green roofs and, and, and parklets. So quite a, quite a combination there and also indoor green spaces um, as well. Um, quite core to the, to, to the approach and, and what the partners have signed up to is thinking about the um, multi multiple functions and value that green space um, provide. Um, and we categorize that um, as, I've, as I've presented here. So in terms of biodiversity, we're thinking about connectivity and habitat provision. Climate, we're thinking about water management, energy and carbon. Microclimate, air quality and thermal comfort. Well-being, sensory um, and active spaces and social we're thinking about engagement and, and interaction opportunities um, and very much the principle of, of designing specifically to meet um, a number of these functions recognizing that not all spaces will meet all of these functions and that's okay so if it's a it, if it's a, a green roof um, that nobody ever sees then focus you know on the on the the, the biodiversity and other environmental benefits. If it's on the street and there's connect, there's opportunities for connection with people, then some of the well-being and social elements become much more important. Um, we really want to um, be able to see an impact and measure an impact. So underneath those key themes, we have sort of defined what what we think good looks like uh, and this is sort of a matrix of those themes across the top and then we have the different types of spaces um, down the left and we then have criteria for for um, how to how to, to demonstrate whether you are um, hit, hitting that or, de or providing a certain type of value um, and this matrix is available um, publicly on the World West End website if you're interested in checking it out um, just to zoom in a little bit, um, hopefully you can read that, but in terms of general requirements, types of things we're thinking about in terms of biodiversity is the uh, number of species um, and the variety of species uh, and in terms of habitat prov provision, the type and quantity of habitats um, and whether or not we have particular um, habitat um, spaces such as bird boxes, bat boxes, etc. In terms of climate, we're thinking about um, retention and reuse of rainwater um, and also um, hardy or, or drought tolerant planting. And energy and carbon, we're thinking about um, energy generation where, where possible, so incorporating that into design of green space or um, 
looking at how green space can impact um, the energy um, usage within a building and or lastly looking at making sure thinking about the um, embodied carbon content of materials that are used um, or um, thinking about the sequestration um, uh, possibilities of the, of, the, of the species that are being planted and then uh, looking at air quality again that will be different types of species um, and then thermal comfort, um, provision of features such as large trees or trellises um, to, to, to think about shade or, or shelter that can be provided. Um, and then lastly, thinking um, well-being, we're talking about opportunities for relaxation and stimulation. Um, active, this is about whether there's opportunities for sport and recreation or informal exercise. And in terms of social, we're thinking about um, whether spaces can provide opportunity for um, people to engage with the space. Um, and, and engage with each other in, in sort of in informal settings um, or also provide opportunities for um, more formal interactions such as gardening clubs, for example. So there's a lot, there's a lot more in the matrix if you're interested in, 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 in checking that out, but it can be valuable for um, a future design, for any, any sort of um, building design. Just to give you a flavour of some of the spaces that we're talking about, um, this is a, a, an example of a, of a private garden in the area. Um, as I mentioned, we look there, one of the partners has done an uh, allotment space on one of the roofs. So this is where um, local the tenants um, can meet at lunchtime and plant vegetables and socialise. Um, an example of a biodiverse roof. Um, again, so this is integrating it with with PVs there um, and also um, uh, invertebrate habitats such as a, a log, log pile there. And then uh, another example is at a parklet. This was what was called the Wild West End Garden. It was a collaboration um, of different organisations coming together to, to um, create. This is a temporary space, um, which was um, a little bit of attention and it was interesting we were able to I'll come on to it a, bit, a little bit later do some before and after monitoring to see the impact that a space like this can have and then lastly this was an example of I guess um, uh, being nature-led if you like so this wasn't planted but it was um, quite a nice thing to see a green-winged orchid suddenly appear on a on a on a biodiverse roof um, uh, so that was a nice little story. So as I mentioned, we undertake monitoring every two years and these are a quick summary of what we do monitor. Um, we look at the area of green space, the extent of the green corridor that we're creating. As I said, we had a definition of that. We look at the types of green spaces, the functions that they provide in accordance with the, the matrix that we've set up and the condition of the green spaces um, with the view to being able to recommend um, improvements to that. Um, we uh, record bat, um, bat flyovers, um, bird sightings, um, the variety of species on, on significant areas of green space. Um, every five years we've done one of these, we look at um, recording invertebrates using certain um, areas of green space. And then it, like the example with the Wild West End Garden, we can do site specific monitoring um, sort of before and after. Um, if there's a particular uh, outcome we're interested in, in, in finding out about. Uh, so a couple of headline figures, four, four bat species have been recorded. There was one sighting of the great spotted woodpecker. Um, we've had uh, four black red start sightings um, and an increasing number of green roofs. Um, and then again, this is the, the monitoring that I was talking about with Wild West End. Part of this was looking um, before and after the impact on well-being. So we had a, a survey that we would ask people before and after. Um, and so in terms of their self-reported well-being, um, we reported in this instance an increase of, of 64%. Um, partly the objective is around sharing um, knowledge and data so one way we do this is through the website which you can check out after this if you're interested and there's an interactive map there where you can click on on the spaces um, that are there um, also on the website there's a, a number of case studies from the, the partners um, update regularly so you can find out a bit more about about some of the spaces um, 
every summer the partners um, run events, a public facing events to um, to share share what they're doing, but really don't encourage um, um, everybody to get more involved in their local area in terms of of, of planting and understanding the benefits of green space. Um, to the extent that the Crown Estate actually have a, a theatre company that come in and, and act out the concept of, of Wild West End, which is which is quite fun. Um, and so they've been quite successful. They're quite nice. Um, and particularly engaging with, uh, with with schools, with children. So we have activity sheets and things like that to, to again, to raise, raise awareness um, and get people involved in a little bit. Um, we are... Um, supportive and aligned with other initiatives going on in London, such as the National Park City. So we've got involved in National Park, Park City Week, for example, um, a couple of years ago. Um, we also share information around what we're sending in lots of um, various publications, such as UK GBC. Um, and we are signposted in several of the strategic documents of um, Westminster City Council as well. And as I said earlier, we do contribute to research where we can. So um, we have quite a lot of requests come through um, um, for master students or, or other research projects, um, which we always try and accommodate where we can, whether that's through interviews or through access to, to spaces, etc. And, that, and that's all for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jess. And we're running a little bit behind time, so I'm now going to quickly hand over to um, Jan, who um, I've got to find my notes. Oh, dear. Yeah, there, there, there we go. Um, oh, I haven't got Jan on here. Jan, I haven't got your bio on here. Do you mind introducing yourself as we're running a bit late? Over to you, Absolutely, Jan. very happy to do that. So um, I'm Jan Stannard and I <clears throat> am one of the co-founders of Heal, Heal Rewilding with its full name. I come from a business background, um, but Heal is a charity um, and our mission, as I'll come on and talk about, is to uh, raise money to buy land to rewild it. So if Richard can see my slides, then I will make a start. Sorry, Jan, could you just uh, full screen them for me? There we That's go. That's perfect, thank you. Great, okay. So, um, let me just go back. So, um, I was really struck by um, the mention of how much nature is being seen in urban areas. And most of you, I would guess in the audience, do much of your work or most of your work in, in urban spaces. And the reason why wildlife is finding a home in our urban areas is because our countryside has become a place where they can't find food or shelter or safety. Um, and I think one of the most striking figures is that uh, in the world of 218 countries, we are, the UK is 188 in biological intactness. That means it's 189. There are 188 countries um, with better biology than we have. And we understand why we're, an, we're a very developed country. Um, and uh, yeah, but nature has effectively lost its, it lost its place. So from our name, you can see, uh, get a clue to what our mission is. And one of the things that um, Chloe asked us to think about was what rewarding means. And what hasn't particularly been in this presentation is how passionate people feel about nature. And this has really come to the fore in the lock in lockdown. And people know that nature's in trouble. And they know we have a climate crisis and they need something. They really need something. And that's hope. And the reason why rewilding as a word has really taken off is because of this. So we've had presentations from people who are either in architectural sustainability, but I'm coming to you, I, I'm here as a member of the human race and saying, this is a pre this presentation is about you as humans first and as architects second. And, and clearly there are uh, niches in which architecture comes into 
uh, a rural area, but in this instance, it's humours in nature's built environment rather than the other way around. So the first thing to say is rewilding doesn't mean land abandonment. There are a lot of people who think that they can buy a piece of land and walk away, but that's not how nature is. It, where nature hasn't had a lot of man-made influence, um, there are a lot of things present that in our countryside are absent. So it doesn't mean land abandonment. I'll come on and, and explain a little more uh, what that does mean. And I think, um, uh, Gwyn, you you used this uh, definition or part of this definition. So the way that rewilding is defined is about that nature runs things, not us. And we're so used to intervening and controlling that this is quite a tough, a tough sell. Um, people, if you think about shifting uh, mindsets, that's quite hard. Uh, and when people come to us to volunteer, they have a spade in mind, but actually rewilding is about stepping back and letting natural processes do the work and seeing what happens when that happens. So our concept as a charity is that everyone can make a difference. Everyone can act on nature, take action on nature loss. Everyone can help combat climate change and everyone can help support everyone's re uh, well-being. So we're not for profit, but it's all about wild things and, and all of us together. That's our mission. Uh, we are raising money, not just in donations, but also in funding, loan funding, commercial lending, because this is really urgent. And we could talk for 10 years about the need to have um, more space for nature in Britain. But you if you own the land, you can decide what you do with it. So with our business backgrounds, we said we have to own the land, then we get to say what happens on that land in perpetuity. And we're not doing, uh, as happened in Summit to See, um, giving local people the sense that something's going to be imposed upon them. This will be contained in our space, but equally we will want to talk to those around us who own land to explain that nature just needs to be given a bit more room to breathe. So our three pillars are nature recovery, action on climate change and well-being, and no time now to go into it, but rewilding helps, helps climate change in, th in four ways, not just in carbon sequestration. So we launched 18 months ago and we've been absolutely inundated with interest. So we have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers now. Uh, we've just uh, 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 agreed a soft loan of three million pounds to help us to buy land. We've now got 10,000, 11,000 followers on social media. So there is this huge groundswell of, of need to do something, particularly the younger generation. You look at that, that those people in the Heal Future panel, you know, they want to be able to walk into a countryside that's rich with life and not just got pigeons and crows in it, which is so often what you see in, in much more developed rural areas. Um, and so Heal is looking at uh, a foundation site in the south of England. Um, we're looking at ecologically depleted land. So this would generally mean land that's been intensively farmed. And we're looking at 500 acres or thereabouts with buildings. And the reason is that this isn't just for nature, this is for us too. So um, we want to be able to bring people together. Um, and if I show this slide, the architects, all of you architect, architects will think, I'd love to get my hands on something like this. Well, there aren't so many buildings like this in the countryside, but we, when we find our, our site, we expect to adapt our buildings. And so much of what has been presented is, is, um, is wonderful to see because you know, niches for wildlife, warm, comforting, welcoming spaces to gather, to listen, to share, to learn and to stay. Um, and for rewilding in our countryside to work, you can't just buy land. In our opinion, you have got to make it spaces for people so that you can um, uh, make income from having courses and workshops and foraging and um, yeah, just bringing people together to, to share their experiences of how to um, help nature. But although 500 acres is um, classified as mid-scale, because obviously there are rewilding projects, particularly in Scotland, of you know tens of thousands of acres. Um, mid-scale scale is still, in, the, in England, it's about um, six million pounds. So in a southern county, it's six million that we're trying to raise. And we've got to the point at which we have our funding for our first site. Um, and But this is how we see it. So we see this central area, but these corridors. So we're talking about um, shrub corridors, uh, water corridors, wildflower margin corridors, hedging corridors. 
to be successful to nature, you have to be connected. You cannot be disconnected from um, ar- from the world around you. Um, and that's how we see our, our um, relationship, our collaboration with our neighbours. And with government payments changing to farmers, this will be an increasingly attractive picture um, when government will be paying for public goods, not for the production of food or for the ownership of land. We, uh, this is a slightly architectural slide. We have a, we use what three words to enable us to identify three meter by three meter squares. And we route people in by saying, sponsor for 20 pounds a square of land. And people absolutely love this because they can uh, say exactly where their square of land that's rewilding is, is, um, is in, 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 in the countryside. And uh, and this is the way that we brought it to life. So a bit like architects doing your architect's drawings, we had to do our drawings of how we saw the land changing. So the grade out squares are the land as it begins. And then there are third, more than 30 species in this, um, in this front slide, but it does show the mix of habitats, the fallen wood, the wet areas, the bare earth, um, the trees that are coming through. Um, and um, as, one of the speakers said it's a complexity which is it has its own um, processes that we as humans tend to sit outside of, but uh, we should become more familiar with these. With these, um, and we're also asked to sort of say how does this how's this going to look in in perhaps twenty years because we're talking nature's time here, not ours. And actually, if you started with um, uh, grazing land or arable land, you would roughly reach these percentages after about 20 years. Obviously, it's very site specific. Um, and this is what nature needs. It needs this mix of mix of habitats. So an absolute whistle stop tour through Heal and its work. Um, so we want a site in every county, wherever you are. London isn't a county, but we'll be near you because eventually we have a site in Surrey or in Hertfordshire or in Berkshire. So um, look out for us and um, follow us on on social media. Um, And thank you very much to um, the RRBA for inviting Heal On and to Dusty for his chairing. to me or is it oh yeah thank you very much jan i'm sorry about not finding your uh, your bio but um to sum that up a passion for nature can help us help nature get back into the countryside and my background and i've got to now segue into the discussion is i've been a bird watcher and a naturalist since i can remember so everything that i do is actually about bringing nature back into the into the world that I live. So I've got 15 minutes or so for a discussion. So I've, I've, I've been listening to them all and I'm trying to connect because it's a very complex sub- subject, actually, rewilding. And um, what can happen in these things is to go with the last speaker. So I'm actually going to go back and try and connect, uh, actually, um, Richard, Gwen and Jess, because I think Richard said a very interesting word, word about the anaesthetic of architecture. I think, Richard, you know, the trouble is at a, at, a, at a street level in London is everybody wants an anaesthetic landscape. So when you change it, they come in and make it clean. And actually, Jess said, you know, why don't we let nature take over so a green winged orchid can actually turn up on a sedum roof, actually, Jess, that was. Okay. So, I mean, I just want to consider how we change that culture, that everything has to be really anodyne. And architects are actually is based on the site in Rewood, which says, like, keep nature out of buildings. You know, it, it's designed to keep nature out of buildings. That's a cultural more. So I just want to discuss that at this present moment in time for a couple of minutes. Anybody want to throw in? Well, I, I, think it, I think the culture is changing, but the risk is that the um, interventions by the landowners in an urban environment, which, and uh, you know, even in a town environment, which is where my um, focus has been, um, are, are, are still top down. Um, I've seen developers introduce what they call grow gardens, where they provide the residents with with uh, carrots that are already in the ground, and then they wonder why they're not motivated to kind of keep it up. Or you know, it's these sort of pop up events where it's all so immaculate, so designed, so orientated around the photo shoot. That it's just not sustainable. It's about having the confidence to just have some open ground and let humans or some other form of nature start doing stuff with it. And 
these these things can go on for years. I think there's great scepticism. It's, it's a pessimism and a scepticism that I came across. No rational reason about sight lines or safety. Um, you know, the track record was that. Work I was doing was used in visualizations from Transport for London to show the public what they were going to build. I mean, that's the irony of it. Using guerrilla gardens as representations for professional landscapes that were going to be built that were never realized. And what was built was soon abandoned because they categorically rejected working with any locals, however um, competitive or amenable um, you know, a great array of gardeners were. So I think that, that it, it's, it's having the confidence to let it happen. More. But yeah, you know, I just if I may, you know, it's the tidiness and the order. We spend hours in design making sure everything is perfect, but there's no consideration of revenue. Maintenance is a burden. Maintenance is stewardship, yeah. if you ask yeah. me. Yeah, that's the. If I can come in yeah. on this, and I think uh, we should um, also really change our approach now to this conversation. It's not about maintenance, but it's about care. I think like we want to care about these spaces and the community wants to care. I mean, the architect's role, I feel, is really being the mediator, no? is really be the facilitator. We are not like there to kind of give instruction on the design, like especially, but actually to facilitate, very often to facilitate communication between the local community and uh, the landowners, the council, the TFL, and, and really to, emphasize the fact that we should not be scared about taking care of our city no it's like these the key issues like no maintenance is like caring and like if we care about the space if we care about our building we want to maintain it at the best no the building grows and gets old and naturally everything has the course no and i i think also start loving this uh, kind of decay. I mean, the, the fact that we are actually growing <laughs> the, everything like a, as human, but as, so as materials, they are like changing with time. I think it's just that part of this idea of understanding the process, no, and making the process a key element, key aspect of the whole design. So I think uh, at least this is the way we work. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe I'm going to come back on that because it's an interesting connection. Gwen, Gwen, have you got any thoughts? Because I remember way, way back that the stuff at Alternative Centre for Technology was looking at mowing regimes in Wales and seeing if they could be changed to take the biomass and actually create energy. So using this connection between good wildflower verges to create biomass, where, you know, people were just strimming the hedges and the wildflower, whatever's in Wales, because that's what you did. Not, not actually, it could actually be something that was useful. I just want your thoughts on that one, mate. I just remember um, that. Was <laughs> I suppose I, do, I wouldn't know on that specifically. Um, I think so many people have passed through cat's doors and experimented in so many ways. I think on the point about uh, bringing wildlife into our buildings and bringing it closer, like, absolutely we need to be doing that, but we also need to do it on wildlife's terms because what we do build for ourselves can be dangerous to wildlife. So if we overglaze, uh, then birds will fly into our buildings and see through it or think they're seeing through. Um, so it can also be dangerous and we can trap things. So we just have to be really careful about the way that we do it um, and just be considerate of the wildlife. And that's where my point about getting experts in um, because they'll know potentially where the pitfalls are. Um, and we as designers can facilitate that discussion absolutely between um, those specialists, the public, and then what's finally built. Um, yeah, and the care of it long term. Okay, now I'm going to. This is a controversial one, as we are talking to architects, you know. And you know, I'm I'm a bird watcher, and I cannot stand bird boxes. I despise them with an anathema. And there's actually a rule in Zurich, and actually 27 cities since the 1920s that you design buildings to allow the Swifts into the roof. It's a legal requirement. But what we do is we buy products. And I just want to extend this is it, architecture is about buying products to solve a solution at the moment. Um, I like what Maria was saying though. What we need to do is design the process with people who know, I, I kind of know some stuff, rather than buy a product to solve that solution thoughts yes i think again like a really integration i think is the key at the design stage 
because we are trying to do very often is adding nature as an afterthought. No, we are like kind of topping up the roof with a bit of green, adding some green toys, adding the bird box. But as yeah, some of the of my slides were trying to to show is that how actually we can create opportunities within the design. Like at the beginning, when we are actually thinking at the design, we definitely we have a wider table of clients, <laughs> like clients that they don't have a voices right now, but we know that they are there so we know that we need to give space to them and one is nature and wildlife and understanding and i really like what um uh we say like about the locality no understanding where the building is and will be so what a building in london will be completely different from a building in italy and like and the environment is different so like how our let's say design or the architecture reflects that yeah, so. I'm going to, because I haven't got very long, so I'm going to use that, Maria, because I think this rural, uh, uh, urban, there is always still going to be a slight difference as much as we try to blur that. And certainly in my work, and I've come from a rural background, the rural, like what Gwen said, and I'm going to go to Jan now, is when we're in a rural location, that is about restoration. But in, in a city, I get a lot of people saying, oh, we've got to replicate, uh, we've got to restore back to what it was. And that's a cultural more. We need to replicate ecological habitats that can function in cities. Got any thoughts on that, Jason? Just to get you, if you give you an opportunity to say something before I segue to Jan. Oh, um, uh, well, I, I think what we're what while we're trying to do is is those connections between between the the, the, the parkland. So I think it it's not so much it doesn't sort of matter what type of green space it is it's just it's about when you put them all together they 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 become something greater than than them, themselves i guess and they and they're, 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 they are then um creating creating that 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 value if you like no it's a good good response because actually in cities that's what i do now is put stuff in nature will come it's not about restoring but you know all of you in a way is I walk across Black Eve every day and I take pictures of wild bees in paths that humans have treaded and made. And often in my work, we go, oh, we've got to take the human out of it. So I was really interested in Jan. Jan, if in the last slide you showed, there's still intensive farming because we need food, but we can't take the human out of ecology. And too much of, I'm afraid, the ecological community kind of wants to, or the nature conservation community wants to take the human ecology out of the ecology um, I'm we're conscious of time so I'll answer briefly to say um, that we are a very successful dominant species and the, the 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 parity of esteem needs to come in for just recognizing that we can't manage without nature and what I love about the idea of bringing nature into into more lives into urban areas speaking of someone who has 15 swift boxes on her house and some internal and some external um, and I fled about, we fled about 14 a year, um, but um, bringing nature in means the connection will be maintained with our, with, our, with our increasingly urban population. So the more that you guys as architects can bring nature into cities, the better the connection with nature will, will be. So thank you for the work to do that. I'm oh, certainly, Swift boxes are one of the only nest boxes I really love, Jack, <laughs> by the way. But, you know, on that, but there's this human thing, humans be very, very negative, but actually, that path which is trod, trod by humans has a benefit to nature and sometimes we can forget nature can have a positive benefit marie you wanted to say something yeah just like going back to uh, the idea of or the question about rewilding no why like what is the difference between rewilding and conservation for example and i think the key element the key difference is actually about the relationship or the the role that actually human play in rewilding so rewilding is Finally, not about detaching and kind of excluding someone or something as part of the picture. No, it's actually find a better way to uh, grow in together. So a more rebalanced and more reconnected way. So I think that's why maybe if we go back to the origin of this conversation that I think is about rewilding, and I, I, I kind of find this uh, the main, uh, the best answer. Great. And I think what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to now... And um, I've, I think I'm going to hand over to um, to the questions, I do believe, 
Um, is that so, Chloe? Or am I a bit too early? I might be too early. Mm. A bit early. I'm a bit early, yeah. So, but I mean, I think there's a key point here, Maria, and that culturally, certainly in the UK, and I think in Western Europe, is there's this idea that there's the rural and then there's the city. And my colleague who used to be at the Greater London Authority said that we need to blur those boundaries. And rewilding is about blurring those boundaries. And that architecture, yeah, yeah. Ne architecture needs to work with others, knowledgeable yeah. experts, to help blur that. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, like mm, rewilding can have a very important and very different uh, impact in urban areas and outside urban areas. A bit what Jane was saying, like uh, about the scale of the project. I think urban rewilding is very much about education, is very much really uh, linking people or kind of, as we were discussing again, like uh, how to reconnect people uh, and our cities with nature. So it's not about the real true impact that actually big and massive rewilding project can do to the benefit of the world. I mean, like uh, those are like things that we should bring, let's say, together and on the parallel path. I don't think there is one or the or the other. <laughs> I think every like we should take every every chance that we get at different scale. Richard, any thoughts, Richard? Well, I, I, think the point about, I think the point about language is really important. And I, it's a, I think as Gwyn set up very clearly and others have touched on too, that um, the term is now, uh, well, actually, and Jan did, the, the, the point is rewilding has been appropriated um, to describe many more activities than the original and clear definition. It's, it's become fashionable. Uh, in the way urban greening might have been, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, or, or even guerrilla gardening. It, it's another term that broadly describes bringing nature and green things and a more sustainable way of, of building and, and living. But I, I think that there is confusion and it, and it brings baggage with it. I don't describe what I do as rewilding. Um, okay, I, I'll just, in if a I may, environment. <laughs> I've got some more, Richard. I mean, I think what uh, I've got a question here to you, Jan, about regenerative agriculture. But I want to end this that I see rewilding as regenerative, whether it's in a city or it's in the countryside. And certainly, what I feel that I've been involved in for 25 years. I do think I'm going over to questions now. I'd like to thank you all. I'm sorry I'm quite brusque and energetic, but it's just the way I am. Um, and thanks a lot for. Um, your talks and um i'm now going to see if chloe um is going to get rebecca i think is going to ask a question i do believe rebecca hi hi um it's just um obviously there's a clear focus of rewilding in urban areas which is fantastic um but how can we mitigate and highlight the loss of coastal and river ecology through coastal squeeze, failed architecture and a direct impact from the built environment through pollution and uh, material harvesting. Anybody want to go for that? I don't mind. Anybody? That's, I'll, I'll go for that a little bit. It's a very complex sub subject, Rebecca, as I'm sure you're aware, is that um, certainly some of the work we're doing in London, I think Jess uh, with Arab is doing is looking at how we can reduce surface runoff into London's rivers and rivers elsewhere in the country. Um, we've had, we're still waiting for the suds of legislation to be passed through to put some might on sustainable urban drainage as a legal requirement. Um, but, you know, that's down to central government. But I think there is a movement at local government level and within the nature conservation movement, the rivers trusts are working very, very hard on this. I can't really answer any more than that because that is a mammoth question to answer. I think nearly everybody's nodding as well. And I hope I've done reasonably well. Um, I've got- Alex. I think what I would just add when? to that is the, well, the need to look, as I said about the bioregion and defining how we look at areas of, you know, really understanding full catchments. And if they cross boundaries, then um, making sure that those are really clearly 
communicated and coordinated um, so that there's not piecemeal um, kind of mitigation or you try and take the whole view because actually those bioregions are what dictate um, all aspects of it naturally. So we, we have to detach ourselves from the boundaries that we've placed and re-establish uh, those boundaries before we can start to kind of really solve the bigger picture problems. Agreed, yeah. And don't build on the floodplain. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but now I, I've got this question from Alice. Sorry about that one. <laughs> Alice. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, I think this question has sort of been actually spoken about quite a bit in the conversation we've just had, but um, might be good just to ask it anyway. Um, I just, it was to Maria Chiara, thank you. Um, I thought it was interesting to listen to you. Um, I was just, yeah, I kind of, um, I think when you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I was just wondering how much an architecture practice like yours, like how much knowledge you have of um, the kind of like really wide networks that the sort of species and like biodiverse elements that you try and encourage in your design, like how they affect those wider networks. Um, and then I just had like a second part, which I've got written down somewhere. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and also, yeah, sorry, the second bit was just um, like, do you make a conscious decision about the kinds of environments or the kinds of landscapes that you uh, take on projects in? Because as far as I'm aware, like a sort of big part of rewilding is leaving like very massive areas of land, which are Kind of undisturbed by human processes uh for these like natural processes to kind of affect each other so i wondered if that was part of your of your design process actually choosing where you practice sorry i hope that made sense yes, absolutely uh, yes, I, when uh, actually we talk about this uh a lot let's say and i always i mean doing big asked about this and I, my answer is always working in team like this is the key actually the key element of a really successful project because like a, as architect as a designer we don't we we cannot design it all let's say we need experts we need to work with biologists and naturalists we really need to work with people locally that knows let's say the territory that knows the landscape that knows the condition of the place and then as a designer, we can do, we are able to get the information to kind of inform the design with all of these uh, people around it, and then let's say uh, making the architecture possible. And I think this is, has like a, a real sense of truth, no? Like a really working in team, choosing your uh, colleagues and uh, people with knowledge that is knowledge that you don't need to let's say, just acquire yourself, you actually need to know how to well work in team. I think this is the key, <laughs> the key answer to, uh, to the question. I think if I may, to wrap that one up is I was very, it was celebratory. Victoria University in British Columbia, the engineering de department have made it mandatory that all students take a one month biodiversity course because engineers are responsible for delivering biodiversity. And education <laughs> is key to this. All architects should do as part of their education, delivering biodiversity. And ecologists and nature conservationists should understand architecture. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> we need to empathize with one another, not, not fight our battles. Uh, can, on I, that, can I, is there time for me to say one thing about the sure. use of experts. Um, when uh, I saw a building about to be knocked down near me, which had meant nesting swifts in, I could see them going in and out. I saw the site manager and he said, we don't have nesting swifts because we had an ecologist visit and it was in November. And the ecologists had come in November, swifts are in the Congo or in South Africa in November. So be aware that the complexity that Gwyn referred to is absolutely true. There are thousands and thousands of species, each with specific needs. And an ecologist is like a GP. And actually you need a, a consultant for your 
your bugs and a consultant for your birds. It is an ecologist doesn't solve the, the question entirely. So just uh, I respect ecologists. I know lots of ecologists, but just be aware that they are not species experts. And so you may need deeper information than that. The deeper information can also be from local residents like yourself, Jan, in that situation. And too often it's a lip service consultation exercise um, uh, from really being on the ground. As we heard, I think it was Maria said, you know, spend time outside your studio, outside that environment, get to know people. Um, Stephen Witherford from Witherford Watson Man did that. Um, it didn't help him because he was working with Transport for London when they were given the project to master plan um, the, the junction at Edmund Castle. But it was a rare, a rare occurrence. So I think really work with local people. They are part of the nature of the environment that you're shaping. Um, I've just got to say, actually, they can knock down a building in the middle of November if it hasn't got swifts. That's a legal issue. I'm not saying it's right, but that's legally they can. I've got to finish up. I've got to finish up. I'd like to thank all of you, Jan, Gwyn, Maria, Richard, and Jess. I'd like to thank Victra Bathrooms, who sponsors this event. And we're taking a short break. Um, uh, the Reba things are taking a short break. And uh, but you can catch up on the first three talks on Reba YouTube channel and uh, reminded to try the networking function. And thanks very much from me.